The NBA players make the right decision to resume the season. They absolutely did. Uh, Marcel, so I'm, mm. I'm thinking of a couple things. Mm. The person, well, one, your platform is your power. That's the first thing. Your mm. platform, it is your power. The players have a platform because they are NBA players. Mm. So Doc Rivers, you think about his, his quotes post-game that went viral a few nights ago. Over 20 million or so people have seen those, roughly 5%, 10% of our country. If not for that game, there's no post-game presser. If not for a post-game presser, there are no quotes and sound bites that are heard around the world. Yeah. So your platform is your power. The other thing I remember is the man with the microphone has the power. You see, when we're up here doing these shows, mm. we got the mic. Mm. So people can sit at home on Twitter and say how much they like us. And those a little more ignorant can say how much they hate us. <laughs> oh, they're ignorant. But, <laughs> but the person with the mic has the power. Yes. The players, by playing, are holding the microphone. You can do more by being inside the system, kind of as a covert operative. Marcellus, infiltrate the system yeah. and do more from beating the system from within than standing outside the system and yelling. So they made the right decision because, again, they are withholding, playing games. Now all eyes are on them. What are y'all going to do now? Now it's just a matter of executing exactly what it is you hoped and you planned on doing. Yeah, um, look, it was the obvious choice. Um, I'm glad cooler heads prevailed in terms of going out there and play. Um, I know that they went through a lot of emotional responses when this first went down in terms of the reaction uh, to Jacob Blake and the reaction to all the civil unrest going on in our country. And let's be real, outside our borders as well, I'm sure, is having an impact since the game is global. We're talking about the NBA. That said, um, it's just amazing to me uh, how much emotional theater is going on right now. Uh, we have to always understand that our emotional intelligence has a hard time having conversations with our cognitive intelligence. If you don't understand what that means, basically you get fired up on something and then try to think through it. You got to calm down. And it's interesting that these NBA players right now, I love the fact that their temperature were, was boiling. I didn't love the fact that while your temperature is rising and boiling, you were trying to make decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a 45-year-old man who's living through multi-eras of this same conversation. And I don't want to use the word redundant. But I also want to be a guy who's leaning in on his expertise, which is my experience. But also, I want to learn from these youngsters who are in a different world, who are experiencing maybe the same things in a different way. So for me, man, I'm a guy who was raised by a father, a few words, but many principles. And I'm now living in a world where a lot of people are of more words and fewer principles. And I'm trying to reconcile it all because... I am not influenced by social media. Mm -hmm. uh, I participate in it uh, selfishly. I, I really post and dip. <laughs> and then I come <laughs> back and say which I want to do. Um, but I see right now there's another, as I spoke of yesterday, a media manipulation of the mind that's happening with social media. Look at social media just in its constructs alone. It's about likes and followers. I'm about love and leaders. I'm a whole different animal. So when I come at situations, I come as a humanitarian. My heart's first. Um, I, I don't look at things binary. It's not me versus you. It's not us versus them. And I hear a lot of that. And it's interesting, as you have even said this before, my Nigerian brother, you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far? Go together. Go together. And it's amazing that when cooler heads prevail, you start to see the alliances between ownership and the players. What do you really want? Because if the attempts or to reconcile, or if the attempts are to eradicate evil in this world, evil in this society, then those will be futile efforts. But let's get to a place where we can mitigate, we can minimize, we can really understand, one, what are the objectives? What does that scoreboard look like, Emmanuel? And then let's try to make plays in an effort to make sure we can get to that resolution. Yeah, I think when, when, when you consider what the players were doing yesterday, it wasn't necessarily a, a boycott because, like I said, a, a boycott, you were trying to affect the target. You mm. were trying to economically affect the target. But I think the players realized, uh-oh, hold on now. <laughs> I don't know if this was a, a broadcast issue. I don't know if TNT or ESPN <laughs> or whoever else holds mm. the rights to those games, mm. Marcellus, is our problem. Mm. Surely we aren't the problem, and yeah. by not playing, I assume we're probably going to lose some of these dollars. Yeah. So what the players were really doing is another form of protest. They were striking. 
They were withholding their services or goods from the corporation or from the world to raise awareness. They have raised their awareness. Now it's a matter of what can you do next, Marcellus? I, I look at it and I think the players realize, and to your point, cooler heads prevail to saying, okay, wait a second now. If we don't play, hmm. what are we accomplishing? Because now we're just going to have a bunch of talking heads talking, even though they may not be qualified. Mm. They might not even know our heart. Mm. So now at least if we play, and hopefully if we educate ourselves while we play, we can now allow the viewers to understand exactly where it is we're coming from and why we're coming from that position. Boycotting and not having the games or going on strike and not playing the games, people just going to go to Twitter, go to Netflix, go to whatever it is and fill their time with other things. So now by playing, you continue to maintain and occupy the space because Marcellus, think about it. Even us talking about this. Hmm. When they decided to go on strike and not play, we weren't talking about the why. We're just talking about the fact that they're not playing, hmm. which isn't accomplishing the goal. Yeah. We're just talking about the players. The players aren't playing, so we can continue to talk about them. They want us to focus on the issues. If you want us to focus on the issues, make sure we're focusing on you so you can direct us to the issues. Oh, man, you said it there. And it, it, what was amazing about this strike, boycott, day off, whatever you want to call it and term it, was the solidarity I saw, not only within the players on their specific teams, within the league as a whole, but cross leagues, other sports. And I know a lot of times we get up here and a lot of people have jokes about, oh, opponents are working out together in the offseason. Oh, look at them all going to the same specialized camps and becoming besties and then trying to turn it on when they see each other on the court. But what's amazing about those facilities is you work out with somebody you don't know and play with. Mm -hmm. And then you work out with someone from a different sport that you would never see any other place but in that place. And what happened yesterday was a sign of that unity of I could reach across the lines of my sport just because I have those relationships and I've humanized this moment. But what's also happening right here is you said how far will this conversation go in terms of having impact? Well, it's going to go as far as you're brutally honest in that same conversation. The dialogue has to be brutally honest for you to have the opportunity, not even the guaranteed result, but the opportunity to really affect change. What's happening right now in our current social climate is polarization at its finest. Blacks, whites, cops. And because of those dividing lines, it put a lot of guilt on these players. I want to tell you what I saw yesterday from these players, what they were really feeling, that they're wearing Black Lives Matters t-shirts, that it's on the court that we are walking around with all the messaging on the back of our jerseys. And the same societal ills that we're protesting are still occurring. So you know what that makes you feel like? My therapist would tell me this right now. You feel like a fraud. Mm -hmm. You feel like all your efforts are not going to serve towards your purpose. What are you doing those efforts for? I must increase them. I must work harder or work smarter. And I think they woke up today with a different realization of how to work smarter. We're going to bring in Rick Buecher, Slick Rick, more for this topic and this conversation on NBA players. Hey, Slick Rick, did the players make yeah. the right decision to resume this season? No, they did not. Wow. Uh, I'm not going to say that they made the right decision oh. in deciding to boycott, particularly how that decision came about. But if you are going to go that direction, you can't stop. You have to define exactly what it is that you are looking to get or to gain from making that decision. And I, and I feel as if we're tiptoeing around or it's become sort of a vague notion as to what this is all about and what they're after. And I, would, I, I can only conclude that what the players are after or what the players were after in terms of considering a boycott or considering not playing, whether it was not going into the bubble or it was not continuing to play in the bubble as of yesterday, is that they do not feel that what the owners and the league are doing is enough in support of what they are seeking, that they were looking more for, uh, for, for more from them. And so I was very interested to hear exactly what it was that they wanted. I wanted to know what those tangible things were that they wanted to gain from not playing. And if they were going to say, we're not going to play again until we get these things. 
and that's not what happened. So we've mm. now been at a point twice with the players where they have had the leverage of their ability to play or not play, to fulfill and fill the coffers of the NBA owners and the league with their entertainment. And they chose slogans and Black Lives Matter on the court and a $300 million social justice foundation, which comes down to $10 million in owner, and which is a lot of money for the vast majority of us, but for somebody who is worth billions, not quite the same. And they decided that that was, you know what, that's, that's not enough. That didn't satisfy us. That didn't solve the problem. So we're, we're going to shut it down again. And now we're back. And I can't tell you what was tangibly gained from this last decision of not playing for two days, it, it, it appears. Mm. I know this, that the slogans and that Black Lives Matter on the T-shirts and on the court did not prevent Jacob Blake from being shot in the back seven times. Mm. I don't mm. know what it has ultimately prevented or changed among people out there. And so that is what I would hope that the players would go after and would go to the wall seeking, which is we're willing, and I, and I feel as if this is where they have to go. If they want immediate change, if they want immediate reform, you got to be willing to go to the wall and see it burn down in order to get there. If not, then you're half-stepping and nothing's going to be accomplished. And you're actually losing something because you're losing your leverage every time you have an opportunity to make an ask and you ask less than maybe you're capable of getting. Slick, um, I appreciate those words. Marcel is slick. This is a time, yeah. at least in my opinion, where we should listen. Hear the other side. Slick, I appreciate your opinion. Uh, the players quite literally have seen the movie, and they've quite literally bought the T-shirts. Marcellus, you said this a few days ago, insanity, uh, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Yeah. 2012, Le LeBron James played for the Miami Heat after Trayvon Martin, 17-year-old uh, black young man, shot wearing a hood, comes out with the Miami Heat. We are Trayvon Martin, a hoodie that says that with his entire team. Well, 2014 in Cleveland, Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old boy uh, holding a fake gun, was shot within two seconds of the police showing up on the scene. Cleveland Browns, they come out in some, jer in some shirts over their jerseys. Justice for Tamir Rice. Well, Eric Gardner, 2014, choked, I can't breathe. 2014, LeBron James, Cleveland Cavaliers, come out in shirts once again. I can't breathe. 2020, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Jake, George Floyd, Jacob Blake. Black, unarmed men shot, some killed, some fighting for their life. Again, shirts, Black Lives Matter, equality, justice. Uh, the fact of the matter is insanity, doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. The players would have quite literally been insane to just continue donning these shirts, hoping that it would lead to change. So slick, to a degree, I do agree with you in that the players wearing these T-shirts and simply taking a knee, it wasn't enough. I don't know exactly where I stand on should they have continued to strike or boycott or should they play and use the platform. My first instinct is always play and use the platform, but I'm not going to sit here in the middle of this climate and vehemently argue with you because I think what you said was very logical. And I think what you said was very practical. And I think, like Marcella said, the players had reached a boiling point where just wearing a T-shirt, that wasn't necessarily saving a life. So what can they do now to try to save one, to try to affect change within their communities? I think that's where the players are at. Boy, I love you guys. Uh, Slick Rick, you went there. I love the gravity of what you said. Um, Acho, I know exactly what I would have done in this situation. Uh, I would have been out there still shooting 30-footers, and everyone would have called me a sellout because I knew that the next day my brothers were going to wake up and they were going to be back on this court with me because of the alliance that's necessary to even evoke change. And I want people to understand that this change doesn't mean it's going to be absolute. There's still going to be people who go out there and commit murder. There's still going to be circumstances and there are going to be situations where it may be even an unarmed black man who's going to get killed again. Because what you're trying to do is eradicate evil, 
but really look at its offspring, which is, in this case, racism, people are talking about. There's classism, there's sexism. We've all tried to attack the different isms. But right now, we have a focus on police brutality and racism. And I just want to let everyone know that these athletes are being put in an impossible position to drive the conversation that is not just our issue, but it's a societal issue and a global issue. And we're now looking for athletes, coaches, sports leagues to solve something that the PhDs even struggle to still come to some sane conclusions about. So ah, the smartest athletes in this room, no matter who they are, they're not qualified for this. They don't have the acumen. They don't have the time. There's a lot of one and dones. There's a lot of guys who didn't even go to college. And I'm not boo-booing on their intelligence. I'm no. booing on how they can apply what they are gifted in to what this conversation really needs. And I don't see enough of platform alliance with people who do actually do this work every single day. So the flip of it is we're asking athletes to go out there unqualified to change this world. Would you ask a PhD to go out there and change the world based on his basketball skill set? Absolutely not. You would not even think about it. It would be a weird episode of the Twilight Zone to see that occur. So this impossible task that has been placed on these players' shoulders is why you're seeing these emotional responses. It's because they're really attempting to eradicate something that has been here forevermore and unfortunately, in some capacity, in some degree, will continue to live on. I agree with that. And, and the sad reality is, you know, we all want to see it change immediately, but it took a long time. It's been ingrained in this country and in, in, in the way people treat each other and some of the 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 some of the, the, the systems and the institutions uh, that have created where we are, the idea that we're going to tear them down in a single day is, is sadly, it's simply not realistic. And I, I will say this, Marcellus, and I think we've all shared this, and it's one of the things that I appreciate being part of this show, is that it is the firsthand, first-person experiences that are shared. I know this in my own life that have the most impact on my thinking and my thought. And a bumper sticker, I, I'm sorry, it just, it doesn't have the same impact. And so ultimately, that's where we're going to have to go. But the players, if they want to, uh, if they want to affect this strong, immediate change, they are going to have to strong arm their way to it, and they're going to have to strong arm it with the owners because you, we talked about the education and the influence and the, and, and the politics. The owners are well-versed in that. They became owners of teams because they are, they, are, they are skilled at that. They became billionaires because they have that ability. So the heart of it is that the players have to recognize that and identify it and they have to call for it, and they have to ask for it. And we'll see ultimately where that lands. But we keep talking in these big, vague terms of social justice reform and police reform. And uh, honestly, the buck's coming out and saying, we want the Wisconsin legislature to reconvene and you know, discuss police reform. I, my first thought was, the Wisconsin legislature doesn't care whether the Bucks play basketball or not. Mm. The, the, the Wisconsin legislature doesn't care whether the NBA plays or not. It doesn't affect them. You know what affects them? If the owners of the Bucks say, we're taking the Bucks out of Wisconsin, or we're going to close these businesses, or we are going to withdraw our political contributions to X, Y, and Z, that's where the change happens, and that's where the real reform happens. But unless the players get real specific on what it is that they want, and it's not going to be a one thing fits everything, but ask for something concrete and refuse to perform, refuse to do your job until you see that, unless you're willing to go there, I'm just not convinced that we're going to get anything more than we've gotten to this point. And to this point, as you guys have both noted, it hasn't changed. It, maybe it's changed something, but it hasn't changed enough. Yeah, so unfortunate. Such trying times to use some of our greatest beneficiaries 
of the American dream of opportunity, collective great wealth, great accomplishment, these players, and to put them as the leaders of this conversation and the leaders of this movement in action <sighs> puts me, puts you, puts you all in impossible positions because we're sitting there forced to defend who you are. I'm forced to defend myself as a black man, but I'm challenged even greater to defend what's right. And that's mm -hmm. where the polarization comes in because the other side doesn't want to hear it unless everyone comes along. And the players, with the acumen that they have, with the experience that they have, at the age that they are, are just ill-equipped for that moment right now.